Well, good evening, everyone. And my name is Janine Kipson, and I intend to stand as the independent candidate in the upcoming federal election for the seat of Bradfield that includes the suburb from Chatswood to Asquith. Welcome to my Bradfield Can Do Better webinar. This time is on integrity reform with our special guest speaker, Professor Charles Samford, a director of the nonpartisan accountability roundtable that is dedicated to improving standards of accountability, transparency, ethical behavior, and ensuring a strong democracy for Australia. I'd like to begin and pay my respects to the Dharamurugal, Darug and Gurungai people on whose land I meet tonight. And I pay my respects to all traditional owners, wherever you may be tonight. I honour their stories, their traditions and culture, and I commit to truth-telling, treaty, and a voice to Parliament for a just and inclusive future for our First Nations peoples. Now tonight, what are we going to do? We're going to have this webinar on integrity reform, and I'm going to show two short documentary trailers. The first one is called State of Siege, and this documentary is important because it was made by a filmmaker, Dennis Grosvenor, who is a Bradfield constituent. The second trailer is Big Deal, directed by Craig Rucastle, that I think many of you have maybe seen, but we're just showing you that trailer to set the scene about why uh, that leads into Professor Samford's talk. And then I'll formally introduce Professor Charles Samford. While he's speaking, if you would like to ask him a question, just type your question in the chat box and our wonderful Wayne Richmond will help me select those questions and then invite you to ask the question by unmuting and saying it directly to Professor Samford. And then I'll finish with some concluding words. So that will finish the formal part of this webinar. However, if you wish to stay a little bit longer, you can stay and have the opportunity to watch an uplifting and fun performance by our musicians, Chloe and Jason Roweth, who are with us here tonight. And they're gonna perform a medley of songs that inspire us to continue this important journey that we demand integrity for this nation at all levels of government. So let's begin. First, I wanted to say about something about State of Siege. I told you it's by a Bradfield filmmaker, Dennis Grosvenor, and he spent three years filming this documentary. It was finally screened in 2011. Why did he make this film? Because he was motivated by the devastation wrought by overdevelopment in his once quiet bushland street, and he felt totally powerless to stop it. And this feeling of powerlessness was joined by many other residents, not only in Bradfield, but across Sydney. And at that time, it's the heights of the corruption within the New South Wales Labor government with real concern about the inappropriateness of political donations from property developers. There's a very last scene in this film that's very quick, but just look for it you'll hear the voice of the chair of an unelected planning commissioner who took over the powers of the local government. And, he's tell and she is telling um, the filmmaker to stop filming. Now, hundreds of Bradfield residents were at that meeting in May 2009. And for three hours, they got up and spoke and gave three minute speeches against the imposition of high rise development in the Karingai town centers. The planning panel then took five minutes and came back and unanimously ignored everything that had been asked by that community and imposed their rezoning on the area. So let's just watch that trailer, State of Siege. Over to you, Wayne. Something is rotten in the state of New South Wales. <laughs> 
I know how important our homes are to all of us. Get out! Get out! Get it right! Get out! We've heard from some of the big developers say, like, I give the money and I expect the Premier to pick up my phone call and talk to me. There is nothing illegal about people making donations. It's a corruption of the whole system. Once they've made the decision that your area is going to high rise, they've basically stolen your land from you. Well, we don't know what's going on, we don't know what's going to happen to us, and we want to know. I think that this present Labor government is probably the most corrupt government since Asker. You hit the 1990s and the pressure from developers really starts to hit home. These large donations start coming in. And the one thing that I've always admired New South Wales for is your level of political corruption. It's time that councils got their powers back. And people like you got your powers back. There's a great movement of people who now realise that by their own strength and by their own militancy, they can do something about the environment in which they live. It's not much good winning a 35-hour week if we're going to choke to death in planless and polluted cities. But I am terrified of the legacy that this state government wants to leave us with. The only grassroots he cares about are the manicured lawns of Karinga. Free speech is dead in this country. Could I ask for you to cease filming, please? Cease filming, please. 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 That film means a lot to many people in Bradfield because they lived through that really time of anger and outrage. And it was against the New South Wales Labor Party with the imposition of their urban consolidation policy from 1995 to 2011, as well as weakening state planning policy. And these weakening came from aggressive lobbying with, uh, from the property and development industry. The trailer also shows New South Wales as having really a history of corruption, going back to the Askin Liberal government when unionist Jack Mundy challenged this demolition at all costs ethic and uh, with his Builders Labourers Federation put on the world's first green ban that now we are so grateful for because it's protected so much of Sydney's heritage and environment. We're now going to watch the documentary directed by Craig Brutasson, Big Deal Now, because this now is 10 years past our first one, and it shines a light again on the political donations that particularly come in this film on the fossil fuel industry and their enormous donations, which has incredibly subverted our democracy and is really culpable for the inaction and our failure to take action on the climate emergency. So let's watch the trailer, big deal. What a politician might say is, okay, yes, I do spend a lot of time with donors. And yes, I listen to those donors. And yes, they give me the money that I need. But it, that doesn't influence my decision making. It doesn't. The right to vote is a privilege that I reckon many Aussies take for granted. But are we being taken for granted ourselves? And if we are, what does this mean for our country and for my kids' future? So it's illegal for me to make a donation on an agreement that there will be some kind of outcome. I donation. think that might be a bribe. My name's Christian Van Vuren. Just so we're all clear, way up front, I am no political expert. So many bad decisions are made in this country because of money in politics. Those lobbyists are like locusts. They are everywhere. Did you ever make donations to the Labor Party? Yeah, sure. It's hundred thousand dollars. What do you get for a hundred grand? 
they have the political clout to actually get the outcomes they want, even if it's not the best outcomes for the country. We've got one of the worst political donations laws in the developed world. Should we be angry about this? We should be really angry about it. Election campaigns are expensive. How are we going to get these laws changed? Well, do you have $100,000? No. If you don't have $100,000, then you've got to organise with other people. We have the power, not the politicians. There's something inspiring for my kids to see and for them to understand that they're not powerless. So that was big deal, and as I'm sure many of you have seen it. But if you'd like, if you haven't seen it and you'd like to watch the full documentary, it's available on ABC iView. And that makes me say, aren't we privileged to have a national broadcaster who does the heavy lifting and shows us important public interest programs about integrity that we would never see on commercial stations. So this webinar on integrity reform is incredibly relevant at this time. Uh, two thirds of Australians support the creation of a powerful federal anti-corruption watchdog. Many Australians are deeply concerned about pork barrelling by governments to win elections, or where one political candidate just alone spent $83.6 million on misleading political advertising. And of course, we're disappointed that we still do not have a strong Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Now, I hope you've been thinking about some questions and writing them in the chat box, because now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Charles Samford, who is a director of the Accountability Roundtable, the Foundational Dean of Law and Research at Griffith University, the director of the Institute for Ethics, Governance and Law, and he is a part-time barrister. He will now speak on integrity reform, necessary and possible. Welcome, Professor Charles Sampson. Thank you very much, uh, Wayne, if you'd like to put on the first slide. Good. Um, you know, slight change to the title with uh, uh, the Academy Roundtable has been getting a bit more stroppy recently. And uh, so the things where we've said reform is absolutely necessary and totally possible, uh, one of our directors suggested the term integrity now. Um, Next slide, thanks. Uh, um, the Accountability Roundtable has been around for about 20, 20 years. It's a mixed, it's, it's a nonpartisan body. It's a mixture of uh, academics, former former judges uh, uh, and uh, civil, civil servants with a sprinkling of politicians, ex-politicians from uh, a range of uh, different, different, different parties. Uh, and we work very hard to ensure that nonpartisan. That doesn't mean we don't make criticisms of, of, uh, of both parties at various times, uh, uh, but that's, that's where we've been in for 20 years. We've been talking about uh, accountability, public trust, integrity and corruption. We've suggested reforms to combat uh, corruption and strengthen accountability, public trust and integrity. And we've tried to swat away misguided, mendacious and self-serving arguments used against those reforms, which is a never ending, uh, never ending uh, responsibility. Uh, the particular paper that I'm talking about, talking from today, uh, started because in March we saw a, a fairly novel argument from a former debater uh, who um, was then the Attorney General. Uh, there are a number of accusations made against him. We won't discuss what they, what, what, what they are. The New South Wales Police started an investigation but found insufficient admissible evidence to charge him. But when other forms of inquiry were suggested, including an investigation of his fitness for office as Attorney General, he denied the allegation and complained that calls for that process uh, would be contrary to the rule of law. In fact, he said that there would be no rule of law left if, if in fact, there was uh, some investigation. The police decided there wasn't enough uh, evidence to charge, admissible evidence to charge him. Therefore, uh, he um, there, it'd be outrageous for any other form of uh, inquiry as to his fitness for office to uh, uh, to take place. 
Now, this is slightly bizarre. We're the accountability roundtable, and we said, well, what happens to ministerial accountability? Uh, I'm afraid the thing is it's, uh, it's not since the 18th century that uh, uh, ministers had to be convicted of a crime before they actually left, left office. That's actually the process of impeachment, which was done at the time that uh, the king chose ministers rather than the parliament. But the thing is that you're accountable um, as a minister. It's not a matter of your minister until you're found guilty in guilty in a in a in a criminal court. But basically, ministers are accountable to Parliament, which has the right to make any inquiries it seeks, sees fit to determine whether it retains the confidence in ministers. And you cease being a minister not because you're convicted of a criminal offence, but merely because somebody prefers somebody else to you. The somebody might be your electors, it might be the parliament, it might actually be your prime minister. Uh, but the thing is that uh, it's one of the most uh, precarious and intentionally precarious uh, jobs in the country. And in fact, when we first introduced responsible government into Australia, ministers were described as public officials liable to retire on public ground. On, 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 uh, on political grounds. And that's, that's the point. He's a minister liable, liable to um, uh, re retire uh, on political grounds uh, as soon as the parliament doesn't want him. Uh, so we thought it was quite strange that you'd find somebody who ought to know a lot about the rule of law. Uh, a lot of people um, uh, made, uh, senior lawyers made the criticisms of it. But we decided that uh, it's important to look at the relationship between these concepts, rule of law, accountability, uh, uh, <clears throat> integrity, and so forth. And we put together um, a small group, which actually included a few, few academics with uh, governmental and parliamentary experience, such as myself. Uh, we had um, an ex-civil servant, and we actually had three doyens of, uh, of our politics uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Barry Jones, uh, that um, uh, Lynn, Lynn Allison, the former 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 Democrat, uh, and John Hewson, uh, and we've come up with uh, a number of suggestions. It's uh, it's not a short paper; it's sixty pages. But in fact, every one of the twenty one reforms we suggest has to be sort of rushed over quite quickly. And uh, uh, we've um, got a lot of suggestions of areas where we could uh, have in integrity improvements. And uh, we've uh, got a wide range with 21 recommendations as to better governance for our citizens. Now, I don't have to tell you that the situation is grim. Uh, you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't think it was, uh, it was grim, although I know the thing is when, when lockdown finishes, uh, Sydney may well go to anything, but I'm sure the thing is that you're there because you think it's pretty grim. And you no longer have to convince the Australian people that it's pretty grim as uh, indicated in the recent Australia Talks survey. Reform is absolutely necessary, but we argue that reform is entirely possible. Despite plumbing the rum-soaked depths of our first and only coup d'etat in 1808, Australia has made major contributions to accountability mechanisms. Uh, and to the extent that I, one of the few things that I disagree with Geoffrey Watson is, is that it was not as bad as the, the rum corps not least because in the RUM Corps, the RUM Corps won. Uh, this, that Australia's got a tremendous record on, on integrity reforms. It started with secret ballots, voting rights, ending gerrymandering, which put a sudden, uh, unexpected, and unlamented end, when in the 1980s, the Australian politicians just decided, let's get rid of them. And uh, some, a reform that was predicted by many to be impossible and would never happen, happened Overnight, almost overnight, when all, all uh, within a very few years, all the all the states uh, created electoral electoral commissions uh, to oversee boundary boundary changes. The Commonwealth's new administrative law enacted in the 1970s was probably the greatest set of reforms, most far-reaching governance reform to occur without a prior example, uh, for without a prior scandal. Sorry, uh, the Fitzgerald reforms. Uh, were quite remarkable. I was there to witness them. And we saw when uh, Queensland went from being the, uh, the butt of every ethics joke there ever was to become a global exemplar. And I mean a global exemplar, the OECD, the World Bank and others, transparency, this is the way to do it. 
And so Australia can do it. As how uh, I'll reflect uh, briefly later on as to why, uh, how, how it happened in Queensland and how it might happen uh, here. Firstly, very briefly, and the next, next, uh, the next slide, please, uh, Wayne. Just want to unpack the concepts uh, uh, which are bandied around uh, and made um, uh, band bandied around by those often for self-interest. But we're trying to sort of sort it out. The rule of law is a, has a range of different meanings, largely self-supporting. But the most important element is that public officials must exercise the power, powers conferred on them reasonably in good faith for the purposes for which the powers are entrusted and without exceeding the limits of such powers. Basically, it's our power, it's entrusted to politicians, and the rule of law means that they can only exercise the powers they're given for the purposes for which they're, for which, which they're given. Public trust is, uh, is a related concept. The powers exercised by officials belong to us, and doesn't belong to the politicians. They are entrusted with, the, with, with those powers by us and they have to be exercised for us. Accountability. Officials are accountable to the extent they're required to demonstrate that they've used their entrusted powers in officially approved ways and for purposes for which they're empowered. I mean, the whole idea of accountability is that you've got this power, you've got to account for how you used it and make it and uh, ensure, ensure that it's you've only used it, that what powers you have for the purpose you're given. Corruption. Again, all of these are related. Uh, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for personal or party political benefit. This is a very wide, widely used uh, definition of corruption. And I've always seen integrity as the opposite side of that coin. Integrity is the use of entrusted powers, power for publicly justified and officially endorsed ends. Thus, in sense, all of these key governance concepts, they're not in conflict. Uh, they're not an excuse and not an opt out for accountability as Christian Porter tried to use them. They're all about how politicians use our power and the purposes for which, for which they're used. And this, if you can see, you see is a, is a common theme throughout all the recommendations. Next slide, please. So what to do? Um, a strong federal ICAC is mentioned and it's necessary, but not sufficient. We've argued you need an integrated set suite of reforms. This is actually what they did in Queensland and what became the global exemplar. Uh, you need supportive integrity agencies and integrity measures that make up what we call an integrity system. We, that although the thing is that a lot of the reforms uh, are around new integrity agencies, in anti-corruption commissions, FOI commissions, and so forth, we emphasise that parliament must be at the heart of the integrity system, must be at the centre of it. Uh, um, and that, <clears throat> as I say, parliament has to be at the heart of, heart of the integrity system, and the other, the, other, uh, the other integrity agencies will help Parliament do its job, make sure Parliament is doing its job, make sure that they're doing their jobs. But it's very important that, part, that it's, uh, it's not just a matter of having us governed by integrity agencies in place of Parliament. We need both of them together in a way that if one slips up, the other will pick it out. Next slide, please. Wait. So we've come up with a recommended set of 21 integrity, integrity reforms. Now, I'm going to only obviously run, run, run through them. Uh, I can obviously expand on any of them and you'll be able to read the, uh, read the full, full document uh, at, at your leisure. But the first thing is we've got seven, seven recommendations to make government more accountable to Parliament. Uh, that... Um, we want to see, we emphasise the oversight of delegated legislation. I'm not sure if all of, all of those here would know about it, but the, uh, the, quite often the, 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 the legislation passed through Parliament will provide for the, the, the detail can be filled out sometimes by the courts, by interpretation, but uh, very often by regulations passed by the, the government. But the thing is that because... Uh, if, the, if, they'd been, if they'd been in the legislation in the first place, both houses would have had to agree to it, which actually means that if anybody, if either House of Parliament objects to the regulation, then that, then that is void. It is not, uh, it, it doesn't pass. So, and it's this fundamental thing to ensure that the control legislation is in the hands of the Parliament 
and not in the hands of the uh, of the executive. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of backsliding in this. Oversight of treaties. Uh, the uh, parliamentary committee has a joint committee on treaties, which can make recommendations, but the government is not bound by it. We actually argue that they should. This should be a uh, this should be a, a more uh, that it should if if the if a if a if a the Senate pass uh, accepts the treaty, it should then be legislated. And if it's not legislated, if it's not doesn't isn't passed by the Senate, it shouldn't be allowed to uh, 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 to be signed. Uh, spending uh, as far as far too many sort of broad based uh, spending rights are given to various ministers and the treasurer in particular. Uh, so, including the most recent thing, over two billion dollars of decisions made but not yet announced. This is this sort of thing needs to stop. The whole reason why democracy is where democracy is because uh, parliaments sought to control the expenditure of the government and thereby took it over, and that's why we're a democracy on the Westminster system. Unfortunately, it's going the other way, going to war, uh, the most important decision that anybody can make. Uh, you, you may not realise that although the decision to go to war is always a political one taken by cabinet, the person who signs off is actually the Minister for Defence. It's not the Governor General. Uh, it's not even the Prime Minister. The Minister for Defence writes a memo and we're at war. Uh, and uh, however much you may respect and value the, uh, the, the integrity, the perspicacity, the forward thinking nature of our current Minister of Defence, uh, even if there was a saint in that position, I still wouldn't, wouldn't want that person to sign off on a war. I want to get parliamentary approval, uh, and also that there be that they be uh, the parliament be, be uh, allowed to set up a committee which gets all the confidential information, and they will then make a recommendation as to whether parliament agrees to go to war or not. This is not an irrelevant issue now. It never has been and it's likely to be even more relevant in the next 20 years. Other areas want to sort of make government more accountable, improving question time, ensuring better com uh, committed committee resources and accountability of ministerial staff to committees in a way that uh, is currently denied. Next, set of integrity institutions to help make parliament account uh, more accountable. Certainly having a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, Anti-Corruption Commission, but we need, uh, we need, uh, <clears throat> Uh, other institutions, the ANAO, the, um, the uh, audit office, of course, is there. We have an ombudsman. We have an FII commissioner. We need a lot of those things to be uh, to be to be strengthened. We need a judicial commission to recommend uh, appointments to, to the judiciary, rather than allowing the possibility of, of uh, bench stacking. Bench stacking has been occurring outrageously at the lower levels of the federal court and the AAT. So far, we haven't seen it at the federal level but would you trust our politicians on either side to be able to stack the court if they had the opportunity? Uh, we need a greater uh, level of judicial, judicial review. We need to go beyond freedom of information to what some people call the right to know. And what I would argue is that simple proposition is that uh, information collected by the government using our resources and the powers that we entrust them that information belongs to us. And you need a good reason not to give what belongs to us to us. There are some reasons, but the reasons that are given so often as cabinet confidentiality, commercial incompetence, uh, and professional and, and professional um, uh, uh, professional secrecy, professional confidentiality are grossly over, over overused and need to stop. Basically, it's our information. Government should be, should be able to persuade the independent body that information should be withheld for us. And they're obviously private information about individuals. That's a classic case where, where one would judge figures justified, most of the rest are not. And so those are the kinds of things. Judicial review has been, which is actually, for those who aren't, aren't used, used to it, aren't lawyers, uh, is the power of uh, judges to say that uh, a, 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 a a minister has uh, misunderstood his power or has taken again irrelevant considerations or improper purposes and can actually nullify a, uh, a decision, an executive decision by uh, a minister or a civil servant uh, because it's, defect, it's, legal, it's legally defective. And again, because they haven't taken account relevant considerations 
uh, which comes back to our basic uh, concept that uh, powers are uh, entrusted for specific purposes. We also want to increase accountability for, um, oh yes, the other thing, we also want guaranteed funding. We don't want the ANO uh, having its uh, budget cut just because it's doing a good job. Uh, <clears throat> beyond that, we want to increase the accountability of politicians. Really important is enforcing the ministerial code, legislating for that code, and ensuring independent, uh, independent uh, investigate, advice and investigation. At the moment, we've actually got quite a good uh, ministerial code. Uh, it, um, it requires uh, that ministers must neither lie nor mislead the public. Uh, but the problem is that who is it who decides whether a minister has lied or misled the public? Uh, and what consequence there be? It's the Prime Minister. Uh, now, we've pointed out that the Prime Minister is, however virtuous he or she might be, uh, is hopelessly and irredeemably conflicted. The, the Prime Minister has appointed these people. Uh, it'll be embarrassing for him uh, if, he, if, if they have to resign, especially if the Minister happens to be himself. Uh, so it's just a, totally contrary to the rule of law that the Prime Minister should be making these decisions. And uh, handing, it, handing it off to a public servant whom you could sack without reason at any time is not an alternative. We have argued very strongly to have an ethics advisor on the, on the lines of the integrity commissioner in Queensland who can give advice to any parliament, to any MP and senior public servants on, any, on pretty well any ethical issue, especially conflict issues. Uh, and then you have an integrity commissioner who will investigate uh, uh, breaches. Uh, and this is, brings together the, the, the best of the Canadian, Australian and the British, British systems, all of which have gone beyond uh, this nonsense of having the Prime Minister uh, a judge in, the, in his or own cause or in the cause of one of, the, uh, of, one of his or her ministers. Uh, we also need to look at addressing truth in politics. We've got, some, uh, uh, we've got a number of specific suggestions we're going to go into, uh, dealing with money in pol politics and media reform, because media is one of the most important accountability mechanisms uh, in our policy. It, the French used to call it the fourth estate, uh, but they didn't think it was an estate run from uh, Delaware, uh, residing in New York. And so the thing is that uh, that's, that's only one part of it. Uh, but uh, we believe that uh, we, the Americans have got a lot of good ideas, including the idea that, uh, uh, that uh, media, media owners um, uh, shouldn't be foreign. Um, which is the reason why Rupert Murdoch changed his, changed his citizenship. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, we thought that was fine to change his citizenship, which means he gave up his, uh, his electronic media here. Uh, but the thing is, as I say, there, there are a lot of things we need to do in addressing, uh, improving the media. I would argue very strongly that the professionalisation of the media is a critical uh, and necessary reform. We go into it elsewhere. Uh, other things is preventing the abuse of power to get reelected. I said, of course, that politicians are only supposed to use their power for the purpose of which they're given. One of the purposes, we, we don't give it to, mo to give money to politicians in order to get themselves re-elected. That's our choice, not their choice. And so that um, uh, the, use of, the use of our money to in pork, in pork, pork, pork barrelling uh, is, uh, is utterly, utterly outrageous. Uh, also, the thing is that uh, we haven't seen much of it. There are attempts to introduce voter suppression. And there is, of course, the perennial, perennial advantage that the party in power gets to choose when the election is and gets to choose the time when it most suits it. So these are the sort of things that, the power, that um, uh, we should prevent government abuse of power in order to get, uh, get elected. Uh, that's um, uh, next slide, thanks. So those are, those are actually 20 of the reforms. And making it happen is another thing, is that um, our 21st recommendation is one of the key to the success of the Fitzgerald reforms. Uh, Fitzgerald had a lot of ideas, a brilliant man, I know him very well, and he had a, uh, he had a, uh, a vision of, uh, of what needed to be done, but he didn't think he had all the answers. He said, yes, we need an intermittent commission against corruption, which is called the CJC, now the CCCC, but he also suggested a governance, what, we, what I call generically a governance reform commission, the Electoral Administrative Reform Commission, which looked at every element of governance in Queensland, 
from the constitution down to FIR, uh, I legislate 20, 22 or 28 areas that needed to be examined. And this independent body, it wasn't a law reform commission, there were lawyers on it, but they were interdisciplinary lawyers and there are economists and political scientists on it. And they had the responsibility to look at the, every aspect of governance in Queensland and to make reports uh, on what they recommended, which went to a parliamentary committee and went to the, uh, went to the parliament. So the parliament had to uh, legislate. It was like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Once it started, these reports kept on coming. And it was very hard for governments to say, oh, we don't want to do that. So in the end, they actually got rid of the Governance Reform Commission, uh, the, the EARC. Uh, but this, I think, is I've often called the lesson not learned. It's a process for reform. Uh, and in these cases, I think that a lot of reforms suggested should be legislated by the first government that's willing to do so. But there should be a long running uh, responsibility of a governance reform commission, which will look at existing reforms, look at challenges, look at problems. The corrupt are actually innovative. Look at what the innovate, what the innovatively corrupt are doing, adjust the integrity system, and so forth. Uh, and I think that was the core to the governance governance reforms of Queensland. They're also open to other reforms later on, which I could uh, name a name a number of them. Uh, and when when a one government tried to, twice, two governments, governments twice tried to nobble our anti-corruption commission. They were the ones who lost office uh, because, in fact, the, uh, there was much more faith in the anti-corruption commissions, commissions than there were in the corrupt uh, politicians. Uh, how did we get to that? And I think this is a question. So here's 21 reforms. and left. All the pessimists will say that will never happen. Uh, look, have one, is, one is, uh, is, is more than we can expect. As I say, this is, uh, this, there was a process like this, which was very successful. And uh, how did we get to it? Corruption was exposed so fundamentally, completely by the Fitzgerald report that politicians felt it absolutely necessary for their political survival to engage in root and branch integrity reforms. <laughs> and I can't, I've never forgotten when Fitzgerald before he delivered his report, both parties were trying to outdo themselves in saying that they were going to uh, legislate 100% of his recommended reforms or lock, stock and barrel. They were trying to think, you know, there is this arithmetic problem that you can't get a percentage higher than 100%, but they were trying to imply that it was, they were going to be even better than the other one. And so it got to the point where the perception of corruption was so great that politicians not acting on it uh, saw, uh, you know, saw retirement on political grounds in their, in their faces. How do we do it now? I think we can. I hope we can, because the thing is, the Australian people are really pissed off. Now, I hope it's going to be one of the, one of the major parties uh, will actually adopt a set of reforms like this uh, and that um, independence uh, will adopt as far as possible, uh, hopefully all, 20, all 21 recommendations, um, if it's only 19 or 20, we'll talk to us about it. And uh, I suppose that's fair enough. But uh, that if the, uh, hopefully one party will, uh, at least one party will go for it. In 1989, both parties were going for it. Maybe that's asking too much, uh, but the more the merrier. Uh, and actually the thing is in Queensland, I've got to say some of the Queensland nationals were so, uh, cross about the level of corruption that had been that had been exposed. I thought there was a bit of it, but uh, had no idea how it. Basically, said, "Do it, reform it. We might be out of office for twenty years, but we've done the right thing." Now, I'm not holding my breath for that to happen. It might if we if we continue if we continue expose it. But the second thing, of course, is the independence of the minor parties. If they say we are going to insist on it. If they've got a majority in the lower house, they can, they can bully whichever party uh, is prepared to go along to actually go along with these reforms. It's, it's a different mechanism for Queensland. It depends on political will, which is based upon a, an absolute determination of the, the, the public that they will not put up with it anymore. 
<clears throat> I'm delighted to take questions. Uh, the last slide will show that the position paper on the, uh, will go on the Accountability Roundtable website early next week with a comment section. Uh, Janine has a copy and I hope she would be happy to share it with you uh, or you can contact contact me. I'm delighted to have any input. I don't believe that this is the this is the fount of all wisdom, but it's our it's the it's the attempt that the Accountability Roundtable has made to list the reforms that we need for our democracy. Questions? So, well, while we're thinking about a question, let's give uh, Professor Sanford a little clap, because what he has done is really give us a very comprehensive analysis of solution-based uh, reform. And that is very exciting, very thorough, but, and, and that all that information will be available shortly. So, Wayne, do we have any questions that you'd like to invite people to ask? Well, well, I might have one question just to get going. Um, Professor Sanford, you know, in a way I'm asking a bit of a, a repeat of really what you've already said, but is winning elections without integrity the main political game today? Uh, clearly, I think as politicians want to win elections. Um, I'm not sure that they necessarily want to win without integrity. I mean, they're not, they're not as principled as that. They're prepared to win without integrity. They're also prepared to win with integrity. They couldn't see how it would be done. But so actually, uh, they, they don't insist on integrity. I think the key thing is that uh, in one sense that politicians are seeking power sometimes for, in order to use the power for the purpose which is given and sometimes their own purposes. I think the key thing is that we want to uh, make it uh, you know, recognise the temptations and opportunities for abusing power and try to close them off so that the irrational politician will recognise that it's too risky to seek to win an election through a lack of integrity and therefore a rational politician will actually uh, uh, do, will, will, will actually act with integrity and the only ones we'll have to deal, we have to deal with are the irrational ones who don't realise that it's, uh, it's in their interests. But the irrational politicians are, until recently at least, have been uh, the easier target. So yes, the thing is, I think that, uh, that there is a tendency, and to some extent the thing is that politicians are those who seek power. And I think we recognise that uh, they're seeking power for a range of different reasons, and we want to sort of channel their behaviour through a mixture of uh, ethical standards, setting, legal regulation, various incentives and various institutional structures to make it unlikely uh, that a rational politician would seek to act corruptly. They might try it to the edges and try to slap them on the fingers when they step over. El um, Elizabeth Dax, would you like to ask your question? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Oh, hi, Liz. Hello, I'm a co-director of the Accountability Roundtable. I'm glad to be here. My question, Charles, is um, with, with the judicial review, there's a lot of judges right now or uh, uh, people in the law really objecting to the lack of integrity in, in government. And there are also um, bodies, groups of judges that are really working. So how does judge, judicial review work and why do we not hear more about it? Um, if you're a lawyer, you know a lot, a lot about it. I mean, it's it's an it's it's, it's one of those. I mean, it's interesting that we have this Westminster system, which we have a number of elements of it. Some of it are well known, some of them are not well known. Judicial review actually started off when the uh, the most of the uh, the uh, legal and executive work was actually done by local 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 magistrates. Uh, or local justice of the peace, um, separation of powers, forget about that. But the king actually ha had a, um, a, had um, a series of judges who were supposed to sort of make sure that the, uh, that the uh, JPs and the magistrates operating in the uh, counties uh, were doing the right thing as far as the, uh, as far as the king was concerned. Uh, and uh, so that this gave a role, and then it's a very complicated history where this became formalised, and there were writs uh, of, uh, of various things. One of them, writ, writ of mandamus, which said that uh, the, which is a, a, a requirement that uh, 
uh, an official act in a particular way, and that uh, because basically it found that the, he exceeded his powers or used his powers in the wrong way, therefore he his uh, action was void, and therefore ordering him to do it right. And there are other there are other writs which develop over over time, and it became a really important element of ensuring that the executive uh, only acted lawfully. Uh, there are limit there are limits to judicial review. It's not a what's called a merits review. It's not it's not the judge doesn't put themselves in the place of the uh, decision maker. Uh, that is called that's what we have the uh, uh, administrative appeals tribunal for. But the judges were making as a matter of law, did the official have the power, and uh, had they. Uh, take into account irrelevant considerations of proper purposes or were they acting under direction, a whole series of ways in which, uh, which was actually a misuse of, uh, of power uh, by, by officials. And this has become more sophisticated. They simplified it through in the 1970s. And, uh, and they, they even went as far as that, the, even it, that this applied to anybody, even the Governor General, even Cabinet, even the Prime Minister could be subject to uh, judicial review, uh, and the judge would that the court would say, uh, um, "I'm sorry, but uh, you did it wrong. As far as we're concerned, you haven't done it." And sometimes they'd say, "You've got to do it this way," and some say, "Do it again." So that that's that's a that's an important part, and it was it reached its high point in the early 1980s, but it's been gradually restricted. And in some matters, only the High Court uh, can uh, exercise extrajudicial review over some decisions. And uh, the reason why is, of course, constitutionally, uh, they can't be taken away. And I think that there are a lot of, lot of lawyers and those who are familiar with it would very much like this to come back. It's not the sole element. Things like an ombudsman, for instance, and freedom information commissioners and anti-corruption commissioners have other roles. But in a sense, they're all, they all sort of, uh, they're mutually supportive. They, they attack different elements of uh, wrong of uh, wrong wrongdoing or failure to do the right thing. Klaus, would you like to uh, um, ask your question? I just I just unmute myself. All right. Yes. Uh, you can yeah. hear me now. Yes. Yes. Well, I I asked the question. Um, these uh, reforms that you suggest are are, are really uh, excellent, but. It seems to me that uh, it would be best if they were written into the constitution uh, in some yeah. way. And of course, uh, to to say that uh, you know that we can write things like this into a constitution is, of course, almost impossible in Australia uh, because it can hardly be amended. So it seems to me that um, the the ultimate answer here is that we get a new constitution that we say well. You know, 1901, uh, we were uh, really, uh, we had uh, six uh, colonies and uh, formed it into uh, one, uh, but not much else was done. And the problem is that this constitution has never been really updated. So it seems to me that updating should be um, a history. Forget about updating because it just doesn't work. We will be busy for another hundred years. So it seems to me that your ideas should form uh, partly the, the, the essence of a new constitution for Australia. People are in the chat. Very interesting. Two things uh, about that. Firstly, as far as uh, difficulty to change the constitution, uh, the very first article I ever wrote, 19, 1979, was uh, on change of the constitution. I pointed out that uh, every single referendum that has been put at an, at an election time with bipartisan support has, has uh, succeeded. Uh, and uh, it's actually appropriate that, uh, that there should be bipartisan support before there's changes to the constitution. Uh, and uh, in fact, where they've just done that and decided to wait until the next election, uh, it's, it's always gotten through. Uh, and very few, very few people realize this uh, interesting fact. It, uh, it, it, to some extent, it, it, um, it can be seen as, uh, uh, wondering why Australians uh, are more prepared to change the constitution when they're distracted by an election may not reflect all that well on us. Uh, so that's the thing about changing the constitution. But with what you suggest, um, in fact, there are a lot of, you know, if you look at constitutions around the world, especially in the former British Commonwealth, 
you see that there's sort of almost development. There's, it's, it's as if uh, that when uh, one, a, new, a new constitution is created in one particular state, in that case, it looks almost the lessons with other constitutions have been included. And Kenya, for instance, is one where they've actually tried to sort of put constitutional bodies for all the kinds of things we've talked, or virtually all the kinds of things we've talked about, uh, written by a brilliant constitutional lawyer, marvellous, marvellous guy. Uh, and, uh, but the thing is that there is actually a question as to whether you want to put these in the constitution or not. And this is something that we have tended to have a constitution, the British particularly, but also ourselves, have tend to have a constitution that evolves, uh, evolves over time by, by, by conventions. And that if you if you do have a constitution, especially you don't want a constitution to change 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 too rapidly. It's not the point of it. But if you write in the constitution, in that case you may miss the benefits of subsequent good ideas. And like what the Governance Reform Commission says, let's change that a little bit. Let's merge those. Let's actually build the links between those two agencies. Various things like this. You've written all the constitution. And you've got to change the constitution again for it. So there is actually a respectable argument to say that some of these things probably are fine if they're statutory bodies, especially if you have uh, bipartisan uh, requirements for various various elements to it. And, uh, and I think that also some of these, so I, I think that uh, we suggest, for instance, that there be bipartisan process for appointment of uh, commissioners to all integrity agencies, that there be guaranteed funding and that this be done by Parliament, not by uh, not 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 put forward in the budget by the executive, and so that uh, so as to strengthen these institutions rather than to entrench them constitutionally. But I think that's uh, it's it's always an open debate, and there are some things you want entrenched, like the judiciary, absolutely, and there are some other what people call fourth fourth arm of government uh, institutions like FOI and, and commissioners and so forth, and ombudsman. I think there's a there's there's a balance, but bear in mind that if you put it all in the constitution once, it'll be hard to pick up the next benefit. And that's a question of how optimistic you are about how the process is going to work. If you think it's all going to come at the first opportunity, it's going to be destroyed by the politicians, then you put it in the constitution. But if if in fact uh, you have a process of gradual reform based upon the governance reform commission, maybe it's better not to freeze it uh, in aspect. I'm always conscious that the American Constitution had some good ideas, but largely its structure, it froze the, the Constitution of George III in England. And they didn't much like George III, I believe. Uh, and uh, so to the extent that the, uh, the next time they had a president called George was uh, more than 200 years after the first one. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> having said that, um, and jo all, all jokes aside, I think that if you look at the American Constitution, as trying to write it down and something that's hard to change, uh, then sometimes they get some things wrong, like impeachment of ministerial responsibility. It's very hard to change it. I think we probably need to finish up now, yeah. Janine. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Sam. But now you can see how complicated integrity is, and he really has given us a terrific overview. In fact, I'm going to have to re-look at this video and play it again because there is so much there. And we can do that because it's being recorded. Thank you, Professor Samford, because I think what's really important is that you really have given us an opportunity to recognise that integrity reform is possible. And you have put together a platform which really hopefully will get onto the political agenda and build that bipartisan report. Because as you say, the public is really ready for it. We're tired of the scandal. We're tired of the secrecy. We're tired of, you know, our democracy under threat. And when we've seen it happen in um, so recently, last January in America, it is really terrifying. So thank you so much. And um, we have a lot of homework to do. I also, but yeah, let's give Professor a little clap. And I also thank my wonderful uh, Wayne Richmond, who has provided expert technical support in hosting the Zoom event and helping with the Q&A. But importantly, I have to thank everyone, each one of you for coming tonight to my uh, Bradfield Can Do Better webinar. 
And I really do appreciate that because this is what I'm trying to do. Integrity is one of my key election platforms, which I'll be running up to the federal election. And uh, there is more information on my website, bradfieldcandobetter.org. And this will be shown there as well. So I finish with one last question. Now, if the Bradfield community really honored me and elected me as a member, what would I do about integrity? And I guess Professor Samford has put through forward a 21 point plan that I've got to go away and really study and really become highly skilled in and to, to really push that agenda. And there are independents in the Australian Parliament, Helen Hayne to put forward a integrity bill, Zali Stegel about truth in political advertising. So having an independent can make a difference. And that really is the challenge that the nation has to decide when that election is called. So I'm going to now finish the formal proceedings and formally finish our webinar, which is almost just a few minutes before seven and you can leave. But if you would like to stay a little bit longer uh, before you press that leave button, please stay and enjoy a musical performance by Chloe and Jason Rowan because they're going to sing us as a medley of songs about integrity and we must always feel hopeful because good people make a difference. Good people with integrity with make integrity it these songs too. And Such I now been fighting the say thank you yeah. and good evening. And I welcome Chloe and Jason Rowe. Would you like to introduce your song that you sang at the 2016 National Folk Festival? Yeah, thank you, Jean. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the Professor Samford there for a very provoking and ultimately promising talk. I think the lecture was really well received here. We're smiling a lot and nodding in agreement and learning a lot. Uh, yeah, John Lindbergh wrote these parodies. John was a master of many kinds of songwriting, but his political parodies were particularly barbed and, and sharp. And uh, he knew when he to, he to pick the right tune. He, he considered it a good tune, far too important for just one set of words. So in this medley here, John Lindbergh, satirical edge he's written parodies so along to tipperary becomes a long way to kanamala pack up your troubles becomes pack up your pumpkins and farewell and adieu to you brisbane ladies becomes farewell and adieu to your premier of queensland here's john dengate's songs for you i'm sure you know these two It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Kanamala on the river Warrigo. I know there's been a gerrymander and I know it isn't fair. But I have to rely on Kanamala. They vote for me there. Oh, Mr. Leocchi Peterson, he's a genius. It's true. Oh, Mr. The Occupy Peterson, he makes five votes equal to. He divides up the whole electorate, subtracts Aunt Edna's twin. Then he multiplies a rural fraction. Oh, that's how he wins. And it's a long way to Kanamala. It's a long way to go. It's a long way. On the river Warrigo oh, I know there's been a gerrymander And I know it isn't fair I have to rely on Kanamala They vote for me there Here is your ticket to the Senate Flow that style, style, style Pack up your pumpkins and your port
Rome So the history textbooks say He put his horse into the Senate Where he always voted nay But a horse is still considered useful On the river Warrigo So the ancient Romans got an old grey mare And Queensland got flown Premier of Queensland Farewell and adieu And goodbye to Sir Joe You useless old bastard Too long you have lost Now your mates have decided That you have to go You ranted and roared At the reds and the greenies You ranted and roared At the black and the white You postured and strutted Just like was of me now your mates have betrayed you, and that serves you right. You pineapple vandal, they've snuffed out your candle. Get back to your peanuts, you senile old soul. Take Flo and your pumpkins, your great pair of pumpkins. And you can start playing lawn bowls and stop playing God. Oh, you Lutheran pastor, come poor, poor disaster. You darling down's despot, you king or oi clown. Get back to your tractor, you seventh rate actor. You pious, hypocritical adjective now. <laughs> you ranted and roared at the reds and the greenies. You ranted and roared at the black and the white. Postured and strutted just like Mussolini. Now your mates have betrayed you, and that serves you right. Stick that up, you jumper, you old Bible thumper, you second hand Hitler, you goose stepping goose. The poisonous old cane toads and gone down the drain mode Like a drill of Bundaberg sugar cane juice You ranted and roared at the reds and the greenies You ranted and roared at the black and the white You posted and strutted just like Mussolini Now your mates have betrayed you I think Martin Pearson said to me once that when once John had you by the throat, he didn't let go. <laughs>